Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this afternoon's webinar. Uh, my name is Beth Overmaw. I'm a strategic plan coordinator for the State Bar and just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items with you before we get started with today's presentation. Uh, the presentation will last about 45 minutes and then there will be opportunity for question and answer following. Uh, you will have the opportunity to submit text questions for today's presenters by typing your questions into the chat pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and I will be collecting those and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to Jason Unger to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Beth. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar hosted by the South Dakota State Bar Association. Uh, as you can see on your screen, hopefully there's a slide there. Today's presentation is entitled COVID-19 from the in-house counsel lens. Our presentation today is gonna be in the form of a panel discussion among some South Dakota in-house counsel, including Mike Traxinger, Dan Rafferty, and Nicole Tupman. I will be moderating today's discussion, and uh, as Beth just introduced, my name is Jason Unger. Um, I serve in in-house counsel for Dakota Layers. That's a chicken egg producing company based in Flanders, South Dakota. Uh, and like so many other individuals and in business and businesses, Dakota Layers is navigating uh, this kind of chaotic coronavirus development uh, as it comes at local, state, and national levels. Um, Dakota Layers also owns a California subsidiary. And that operates as a distributor. And so our staff here is steeped in California rules and regulations as well. And finally, in addition to my roles uh, in-house, I operate a solo office where I represent clients in either South Dakota or Minnesota on civil and criminal matters, but mostly serving as court-appointed counsel for indigent criminal defendants in Moody County. Um, Dakota Layers uh, is approximately in the 90 to 100 uh, employee range we do business nationally, mostly with distribution of our products, um, and then very much concentrated in California where our distribution company is located. I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists to introduce themselves, and we'll start with Mike. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Mike Traxinger, uh, in-house general counsel at Egg Tiger Cooperative. Uh, we are a uh, large uh, agricultural cooperative that offers a variety of of goods and services to our members. We have over 900 employees located in 50 plus communities, mostly in South Dakota with um, about a handful of those, eight or nine in North Dakota. So the majority of our locations are in South Dakota. Um, everything from agronomy, grain, energy, um, all across the board in terms of kind of the scope that we offer uh, our customers. And um, thanks for the opportunity to participate in the panel and look forward to the discussion and hopefully some good questions. Thanks, Mike. Um, Nicole, we'll turn it over to you. Is, is Dan on yet, if I can jump in on that? Doesn't sound like it. We're waiting for Dan to get some audio situation figured out. So Nicole, if you could introduce yourself. Sure, my name's Nicole Tutman. I'm Assistant General Counsel at Midcontinent Communications, known as Midco. Uh, we have about 1,500 employees in South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, Western Wisconsin, and the Lawrence, Kansas area. Uh, I've been at the company, oh, two and a half, three-ish years now, and we are, of course, a telecommunications company, so we are uh, enabling a lot of uh, work-from-home folks, which I'm sure we have on the line here today, along with our other companies. So uh, excited to be here and to talk, and feel free to ask a lot of questions. It makes it uh, more interactive for all of us. All right. Thanks, Nicole and Mike. And if Dan gets on here, hopefully he'll just interrupt us, but we'll keep uh, searching him out. Um, as we get started here, one of the first things that has come up with coronavirus as it's kind of gotten uh, its steam going uh, has been a discussion about who are essential employees, what are essential businesses. The Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency within the U.S. Department of Homeland uh, has provided guidance on essential critical infrastructure during this response. Uh, all of our panelists here are in organizations that are considered essential and we'll ask them one by one what that means to their companies. And again, we'll start with Nicole. 
So telecommunications is considered essential and critical infrastructure. We're also one of the industries protected underneath the Patriot Act. Uh, so we can maintain, construct, and repair our networks. We can hook up new customers. Uh, we are allowed to have our retail stores open, but following the guidance of our states, we have closed most of our con uh, consumer or customer experience centers and instead are doing at-home drop-offs of equipment and deliveries of equipment to consumers, uh, just so that we don't maintain those retail spaces in accordance with our state's uh, work from home order, shelter in place orders. So uh, we are allowed to have our folks out and about if they are maintaining, constructing, repairing networks. Most of our people are working from home, but our field technicians and field engineers are out in the field. And so for us, that means uh, that we have work from home. We have uh, letters for everybody stating, yes, I am essential. I am allowed to be out in the community, even if there is a shelter in place order. You know, our states of Minnesota and Kansas have stronger uh, shelter in place orders than we do here in South Dakota, but they do have to maintain those letters and keep their IDs on them so they can be out. Uh, but that's what essential means for us. Thanks, Nicole. Mike, can you uh, give your perspective? Sure. Um, so, as, a, as our co-op, we, under, under the United States Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency guidelines that were issued um, on March 19th, um, and then I think there's been a subsequent amendment to those, uh, Agtegra falls under a few different sectors depending upon our divisions, um, but food and agriculture, energy, transportation, logistics, and critical manufacturing. Um, for the most part, uh, you know, we're located, obviously, in South Carolina, like I mentioned, but we do have some folks that are traveling to and from Minnesota. We have some employees in Minnesota, and so uh, we've also issued letters for those folks that are located there. Um, but one of the things that our leadership team did once those guidelines came out was go through our organization and identify any areas that we don't think would fall underneath those. Um, one of the things that we kind of randomly have are some storefront operations, um, particularly fireplace installations which sounds a little random, but we, we um, as an organization, went and designated some of those um, to determine if they actually fit within the guidelines or not. Um, for the most part, the majority of our operations do, uh, and we've continued those, but we've taken precautions like most folks have in terms of um, shutting our, our front doors to customers um, to protect our employees and the customers as well. Thanks, Mike. And for our listeners, and I'll just check in again with Dan if he's there. Go ahead and jump in, Dan. But Dan is a uh, counsel for uh, or within the Avera system. And so uh, inevitably, he would also qualify under these uh, essential designations. Um, but what you both brought up, brought up uh, Nicole and Mike, um, are kind of just divisions within your own entities. And there may be some essential areas. There may be some non-essential so for your employees who don't need to be at work or in the field, how have you handled them working from home? Do you set them up um, individually or in mass? Uh, and how do you make that distinction? Uh, and how do you communicate that with your employees? Uh, Nicole, why don't you start again? So we started all non, everyone who is essential, even if they are considered essential, like our back office is essential. Anybody who could started working from home on March 13th, and we've started uh, transitioning since that time. A lot of folks like me have laptops already and already have docking stations at home because we have flexible workplace policies. Other folks, we did have some spare um, computers on uh, within our, within our uh, IT services. A few other folks still have to use their own computers, but we have Almost everybody working from home, which includes our three to 400 person call floor, which is at home and able to take calls largely from home there. Uh, we are allowed to go to the office to pick up work or you know, I have to go check the mail for getting you know, original signatures, easements, things like that back. But otherwise we are supposed to work at home. It is by company policy if it is possible for us to do so. Uh, so we've tried to take a pretty strict stance just of how many people are in our facilities that you do have to work from home if it is at, uh, at all possible. And it is currently an indefinite duration.
sounds like Mike. You know, we haven't, oh, not Mike, sorry, Dan. We had some issues with Dan earlier uh, and, and getting some feedback, but uh, we are indefinitely working from home and we just get updates occasionally from our prevention team that is working to determine uh, when we can return home. Return to work, sorry, not home. Sure. Mike, how about you? Have you guys, uh, with the, the areas that you do have some discrepancy, have you guys had any uh, issues or how was your process in determining who should be working at home and how did you guys get that set up with your company? So for, for us, it's really been kind of um, a management type decision within the division. Uh, we haven't, we don't have not issued a mandatory work from home. Uh, given our organization structure, we have quite a number of employees that are operations based that have to be at our location, whether that's a grain elevator or an agronomy location, um, as we bring in seed and, and prepare for the, the spring, um, the spring planting. So our, really our management, what we've seen is, for example, our IT department, um, previously is generally located in one space. So some of the things that management have done are take those um, the key staff that are support and spread them out. Um, either if they can work from home, um, everybody's working from home for the most part. Um, for those that aren't able to work from home, um, you know, we've tried to segregate them out to a couple different of our locations so that if we did have a location that was um, infected in some way, shape or form, um, and we had to, to go down at that location for a couple of days to clean, um, we would have other staff at other offices that are available. Um, and so it's really been a division by division management type orientation in terms of, of getting those folks to determine who's essential, who's not in terms of working from home. But uh, to, the, to the most extent, we, um, we've been able to, to weather this pretty well in terms of being able to get operations. Now we're a little bit nervous going into the spring planting on what that looks like, um, but we've also been taking uh, additional precautions in terms of our locations and cleaning, and I'm jumping the gun here a little bit on on some of the other questions, but those are some of the things that we're doing as well. Yeah, well, jumping the gun is, is all right, so let, let's just jump into it then. So the next area we'd look at, obviously, if we're talking about um, getting people to set up at home and making those decisions, for the employees who need to be in your facilities uh, and who need to be coming to work and going out in the public, uh, Mike, why don't you just keep discussing and elaborate a little more? How are you as a company monitoring, monitoring your, your employees, whether it's for symptoms uh, of COVID-19, uh, you know, as they are coming to work or before they're getting to work? And then what policies do you have in place when they're at work uh, or when they're out in the field? So in terms of um, the monitoring of the employees themselves, We've given some strong guidance we're passing on communications on a fairly consistent basis to our employees um, to remember to, to take the actions of washing their hands and, and watch their symptoms um, and encouraging them uh, to limit all non-essential travel, um, both for personal and, and work purposes. Um, we haven't taken any steps as far as mandating any sort of, I know some companies like Walmart have started um, taking uh, employees' temperatures we've kicked that around we haven't gone as far as as wanting to do that i think administering that is some of the things that we're, we're struggling with how do we would actually do that um, but we have gone um, our safety department is quite robust uh, and they've gone to cleaning the, each of our facilities um, in terms of wiping down common spaces and surfaces uh, at least twice a day if not more um, so we've ramped up our cleaning um, capabilities at each of our locations uh, anybody that has um, any potential symptoms and is not comfortable. We've been working with them to encourage them to work from home or get them set up for work from home. One of the things that we did initially, um, we have a lot of, of hourly folks and, and for folks that had just started, what we ended up doing was we uh, amended our PTO policy to allow folks to go in the hole um, up to 80 additional hours. Um, we were particularly impacted as I'm sure many folks were in terms of schools and daycares um, being closed and so that's really where that policy change was prompted um, coming into it in terms of trying to give them some flexibility especially for newer employees who don't maybe have the PTO built up that, that others have had. Um, we have a plan in place and an action team if there is uh, a positive case with an employee in terms of uh, the cleaning that would take place right after that. 
uh, as well as working with your, your manager on um, communicating and trying to ask them who potentially was exposed. Uh, we're kind of segregating out on a location by location basis and also um, using our, our regional managers and our location managers as a, as a network to really disseminate communication. Uh, and our HR department has really been the, kind of the lead on all of this in terms of uh, navigating navigating the structure itself and making sure that the communication flows back and forth. So maybe not as, as strict as, um, as some folks organizations have, but um, you know, kind of a little more working model in terms of, of what we're putting out there and, and seeing uh, how the results are working. Thing. And, and that sounds like a, a pretty extensive, uh, and, and I can relate, a, a very fluid situation when you're making those decisions. Nicole, is there anything um, you want to add to that list? No, I think, you know, we've been doing a lot of the same things. Of course, we don't allow, we're not allowing visitors uh, unless they're absolutely necessary, as in they're vital to the critical infrastructure and our network equipment. Same with allowing employees to go negative on PTO or, or providing some sort of PTO, reassigning job duties. You know, with the new guidance that came out in South Dakota, the new executive order, if you're over 65 and in one of the counties, which includes Minnehaha and Lincoln, or you have underlying health issues, you're being urged to stay at home, is making sure that if that's a field technician who would be out in somebody's home making an install, that they have other job work that they can do, other job duties they can do. And so that's been on the fly, getting folks to do technical assistance and supporting at home installs and creating uh, kind of our first time right and training manuals and doing a lot of that work that wouldn't typically be assigned to them. So they don't have to use their PTO. Uh, so it's really been a more of a fluid situation of just responding as the different states issue different orders. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really great point. And if we could, I, I'd like both of you to just weigh in a little more. You both talk about, you know, getting kind of ahead of the game here and initiating uh, corporate-based um, responses to some of the issues with employees, whether that's PTO and changing those policies or finding ways to keep uh, different types of employees employed. Um, and you're both right. I mean, this has process has been uh, a whirlwind trying to keep track of the, the changing situations and rules and regulations. So for, uh, I guess, more of our general litigants or our general attorneys that are advising businesses, what advice can you give them uh, that relates to uh, their clients that may have businesses and they're trying to make decisions uh, for their employees and their businesses? Uh, what advice can you give uh, different attorneys for how to look for the right type of information to advise their clients? So I might, think, might, if you want to jump in first, or Nicole, sorry. So I think one that's ahead, been, Nicole. yeah, thanks, Mike. So I think one that's been tough for us is the executive order that was just issued, and there's some conflicting guidance in, this is the South Dakota executive order uh, from yesterday, there's some conflicting guidance in there, and the shoulds and the shalls and the mays that become really important. And it is very, very useful for our outside counsel if they can give up back to us, this is what the law, the executive order says. Here's kind of your safe zone, here's your gray zone, and give us the black and white where you can. That's really useful. I don't know about Mike, but we're certainly looking to our outside counsel to give us advice here. You know, but sharing resources, I know the in-house committee has been pretty active in sharing resources that we see. I see the state bar has got a nice list of resources, but trying to find out where you think you've got cover to protect your company. And so that's for like ADA, you know, for using thermometers. Yes, you can use thermometers in a time of pandemic under the ADA. That's what the DOL has said. It's, uh, it's waived some of those requirements, but you have to know how to administer a thermometer. So then how do you do that? We know we are typically, our receptionists don't typically do that. And so how do we transform that? And for us, we just don't use thermometers at work because it's too much of a risk. But trying to find the black and white, I think is really helpful for your clients. Mike, any additional comments there? Yeah, I, I think um, while this whole situation is, is unfortunate for everybody involved, I think one of the interesting things that is kind of come out of this is it seems like 
uh, there's been no shortage of communication coming from various sources in terms of um, firms that we use for outside counsel, um, as well as you know the Coles leadership on the in-house committee. I think all it all just comes down to asking. Um, I was on another board call this morning with some folks that are in the ag law world, um, and one of the things we've developed in our organization is a response matrix. And I think we got the idea from some other company that's done it, but it's really a tool that's that we're going to be using to give management um, direction and some guidance on how to respond depending upon some hypothetical situations that we um, that we could expect um, may happen at our locations. Um, or involve our employees and or our customers. Uh, and so I think the big thing is just if you, if you have questions, feel free to reach and uh, reach out and ask. I think we're all here to help each other uh, work and navigate our way through this. And I would just echo what Mike said there. I think on the response matrix, we had, I think uh, maybe a year, year and a half ago, implemented something like this at Midco where we have a response matrix for different types of scenarios which actually did include um, a public health emergency. So we had some discussions going forward, you know, uh, at the time there that we've really drawn on and using this. But I would say for general practitioners who are advising companies, if they don't have those response tools and those matrices and those types of plans, now is a good time to start getting them or when things calm down, is, it would be a good thing to offer to your clients. That was a very useful exercise that we did as a company. And I think a lot of companies now that they've gone through this pandemic or are going through it, will wanna have types plans like that in place. And I think they can be incredibly helpful and a really nice value add for your clients. Yeah, good comments. I, and I agree with both of you guys. Um, I've seen similar things. We've gone through similar um, drills and practices where we've outlined as many different disaster scenarios as we can we try and write up as much of our response as we can and then you actually practice them from time to time uh, whether in theory or in, in practicality whether that's a fire drill or something like that but i think those are good comments for um, attorneys that may be getting questions from their clients the, the biggest takeaway i've seen even in our own in-house committee is that this is there's too much information for one attorney to sift through everything but luckily we've got a, a pretty close-knit uh, committee we've got a close-knit bar and there are a lot of resources there are a lot of people to help weigh in on different things and that approach has been uh, immensely helpful for me um, this tends to almost get a little outdated but how have you guys been handling uh, business and personal travel for your employees or people that are coming into your facilities uh, if you're able to monitor that. Um, I know from Dakota Layers experience just recently where we uh, utilize USDA grading services for egg products, we had uh, our on-site grader randomly reassigned to a location in Texas and show back up at our door um, in end of March asking, you know, here I'm, I'm here for wor work and we simply couldn't allow him on our facility. It was too much of a risk. What steps have you guys taken with your own employees or uh, other uh, industry personnel coming in and out or engaging with your employees with travel? Hi, this is Dan. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Dan, and perfect timing. I just asked a travel <laughs> question. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a minute to, to gather your thoughts, but uh, Nicole, no, I'm... Uh, why don't you start, and then uh, we'll repose the question for Dan. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Dan, for joining. So we have since so mid-March had travel policies in place. So we have not uh, been asking folks to do any business travel unless it is absolutely necessary. And then that's really only between our facilities. And if you are taking personal travel or business travel and you've been to a hot spot, uh, which is now changing, but at the time was more like New York, California, Washington, you had to self-quarantine then for at least a week. And if you had been exposed, if you've been exposed to anybody, you have to self-quarantine for 14 days. And that is just a, it's an evolving process now where essentially we're asking you after you've traveled for personal reasons, you're supposed to report it to your supervisor and then to stay home. And it ends up not having that much of an impact on our company since so many of us are working from home anyways. Uh, but it has meant some limitations uh, for our field engineers and construction folks who typically travel between South Dakota and Minnesota uh, because Minnesota is a hot spot. So that's been the 
a little bit more of, a, of an issue there with Minnesota, but otherwise, no travel. You have to self quarantine at home. Thanks, Nicole. And so, Dan, the the question is clearly about travel uh, among right. your employees and, and other personnel. Dan, if you could, why don't you just introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your company. Um, and so far, Dan, what we've been addressing uh, is what it means to be an essential industry or an employer yep. uh, during this coronavirus period uh, and steps you've taken with your employees, both at work and um, and at home. I think we've gotten a pretty good coverage of that. If there's anything specific you want to add to those categories, go ahead and add them. But uh, again, the question is about travel. So introduce yourself and then take it away. Sure. Sorry about that. It was frustrating because I could hear you all. So <laughs> I caught most of what you guys had said. So thanks for that and, and for uh, allowing me to join in late here. Dan Rafferty, I'm one of the attorneys with the Office of General Counsel for Avera. Uh, we have about 15,000 plus employees over a five state region in North and South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota. Um, the only thing I'd like to advise or uh, discuss a little bit about what's already been said before I address travel was how we uh, how we address public facing employees, and we took it from a different tact. We looked at it from those employees who were pregnant and at high risk, as, as designed by the CDC. And so, um, you know, for those who are high risk, we try to move them. Uh, we'll see. First of all, are they working in an area where COVID patients are being treated, or or we have suspected COVID patients? If not, they can they could stay and work where they were, uh, although we do have a lot of people working at home as well. Um, and then if they couldn't, uh, could they could they be reassigned or could they still work with PPE if PPE was available to them? Uh, and then if not, they were. And of course, we'd follow any uh, uh, look at any recommendations from their treating provider. So we looked at it from, you know, are they themselves at risk? Um, and then with regard to travel, it's very similar to what Nicole just said. We're strongly discouraging travel. Uh, Work travel within the Avera footprint, our geographic region, is allowed for work purposes, but we do discourage any sort of travel for leisure purposes. So, for example, I live I live in office in Yankton. Uh, even though Sioux Falls is in my footprint, they don't want me to go to Sioux Falls unless it's for work or to see a doctor or something like that. They don't want me to go to Sioux Falls to go to Costco or, or one of the big box stores or something like that. So that's being discouraged. Very similar, um, if they are leaving the footprint, they need to talk to uh, their supervisor first to get that approved. And we've decided that if uh, they talk to the supervisor and advise not to go and go anyway, that that will be a disciplinary event. Um, anyone who's traveling by plane or outside the Avera footprint is 14 days isolation, has to call employee health and have to be symptom free prior to returning to work. And for those people who violated the travel policy, in addition to corrective action, their 14 day isolation is either no pay or PTO. So that's kind of what we've done uh, with regard to that. Certain other exceptions apply as far as family emergencies and things like that. But uh, regardless, it's that 14 day isolation period and then being symptom free before returning to work. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Mike, any, any additions? Um, the other thing I'd, I'd chime in, um, so we have a number of third-party contractors um, that are at our facilities, um, whether it be for maintenance um, or for us, the most expensive is, is trucking. Um, and so we've been working with the safety department. Um, we've been doing some trainings with employees on best practices, um, you know, as recommended by the CDC. Uh, and so we are passing that down to kind of the potential third parties that are not necessarily our customers, um, but are, are folks that are integral to our to our operations at our facilities to make sure that we're providing them with the same guidance um, or at least training that we are giving to our employees ourselves. Great. I just want to kind of sum these all up because so many of these again are changing um, from almost day to day. But the biggest thing seems to be communicating these policies to your employees. So Dan, if you want to jump back on here, what is what has your company done uh, as massive as it is communicating all of these different uh, updates and policies with your employees? So we have a um, an app uh, em employee communication tool called the Avera app. So all these different types of issues are going out on what we call it the green line and that hits our app. So anyone that has the app uh, has that. We're also making sure that all of the um, green lines, our information line uh, is being sent out to all the employees in their in their um, email as well. 
And then obviously, for example, we'll do special communications just to leaders as those people have been identified in our system, like we had to do last night with the with Governor Nome's executive order, making sure everyone understood that it didn't apply to healthcare workers as a critical infrastructure. Um, and so those will be selectively targeted. And then um, all of our information that gets posted on the green lines, then we'll make it onto our internal intranet site uh, and uh, kept there. All the current information is there. Uh, so employees can always go to that site as well for, um, for information. Wow, that sounds really impressive. I had no idea you guys had that uh, sophisticated of a system. That is uh, really good. Nicole, Mike, any, any things that you guys are doing? So um, we have a little bit more of a challenge where we have a number of employees, um, probably a fifth of our employees don't have a, a company issued email just because they're generally in a warehouse or operations type folks. Um, and so we've taken the approach of having um, fairly consistent um, communications with um, what we would call our key management staff, um, about a hundred different folks that um, supervise different folks across the, our network. Uh, and so we've probably been having at least weekly calls with those in terms of disseminating communications and providing them with the tools and resources in written form. Um, but then we've really been leaning on them to uh, be sure that they're communicating um, any sort of policy changes or procedural changes down to all of the employees that they supervise this has been our approach. And we use something similar to, we have an, you know, our internal intranet site that is updated. We have blasts that go out to everybody who has email, uh, well, which is everyone in our company is on, on uh, Midco email. We also have a WebEx um, internal system that we use. And so those can, it can go out to the groups and our crisis management plan has a kind of hierarchy of discussion so we can really disseminate information pretty quickly. But we have one central team that works on this and they control all the communications. Great. So that still leaves the operational side of everybody's companies. And so with the uh, recent enactment of the CARES Act and the stimulus bill from Congress, can you each speak from your own business perspectives, what portions of that bill are most interesting or useful to your company? And what, do you, what would you recommend are things that, again, uh, an attorney that may be advising different employers, what are things that they should be looking for? And let's start with Mike on this one. Um, so for us, we're, um, because we have 500 plus employees, um, we don't qualify for a lot of the, um, the different programs or provisions of the CARES Act. Uh, the only thing that we've been somewhat engaged in is we have a few subsidiaries uh, that we are a member of um, that they have applied through their lender um, for the SBA PPP um, loan program uh, and gone that route. And so we filled some questions there. Uh, around some of the definitions of affiliates and such. There's been a number of webinars out there um, uh, in terms of how to apply for that program. But if you haven't taken a look at that, um, it's something that I would encourage everyone to do. Um, I know some law firms have even applied for it uh, as well. It seems like there's a pretty broad um, capability to apply for that program and, and see what benefits that there could be coming from that. Thanks, Mike. How about Dan, I know you guys are well over the 500 threshold for most of these provisions, but is there anything in there that you have found useful for you guys? Is there anything that you have been looking into or that you would recommend other attorneys look into? Well, if you have health cl care clients, yeah, there's a lot in there, uh, particularly as it relates to, uh, for us, we're looking at making sure we um, can uh, take advantage of the CARES Act as it relates to preparing for COVID. And a lot of that is um uh, the training so you know i don't know if you know what healthcare is doing right now but uh we're in phase one of our triage protocols and that's pretty much the same statewide where we're trying to expand our empty capacity getting ready for a surge of patients and so that's why a lot of the procedures uh elective procedures stuff have been canceled uh, those sorts of things we're trying to expand the capacity of our beds and so uh, as that occurs, though, there might be staff who aren't used to working in the hospital from clinics or long-term care or vice versa, who need to be trained in specific procedures related to the COVID treatment. And so those, I think there is some dollars and funds in there for healthcare providers who are doing that type of training and preparation. 
to take advantage of some of those care acts. The other thing we're looking at too, if um, you know, if down the road, particularly after this is over, depending on what it looks like, um, just getting ready. There's no announcement, I promise, from the various perspective, but obviously looking at all of the different unemployment enhancements that have been made due to CARES Act. Hopefully we won't have to have people take advantage of those, but um, we've looked at those in, in depth and made sure we're on top of what those enhancements of the unemployment compensation programs are. Thanks. Great. Nicole? Yeah, so for us, I think the one thing that I would mention is that the 500 cap can be subject to increases depending on your industry. And that's on at um, 13 CFR 121. And that's those are the size standards that SBA uses for the North American Industry Classification System Codes. And I know that because I've looked at it just to make sure that we don't qualify and we are just over the threshold uh, for telecommunications. But that's just one thing to, I would caution you to look at uh, that specific code for your clients and interpret that appropriately. Uh, because it's not just a strict 500 across the board. It, it is a little industry dependent. Uh, the other things that we as a communications company are uh, interested, it's interesting to see in there are the telehealth funds. So for providers, especially like Avera, that's got the e-care program and can offer more telehealth. There's more grants that are available there. There's also a VA program. So for veterans who are living uh, well, for, really for any veteran is to be able to have access to broadband in order to do things like telehealth visits and otherwise be connected. So I think you're going to see a lot of kind of rural broadband and increased broadband funding coming out. There's a lot of discussion in the fourth stimulus bill on how to do that. So those are things that we're watching. Uh, our business is still obviously very strong because of uh, the nature of what we do uh, but like any any good employer we're doing our due diligence making sure we know what all of the employment requirements are unemployment and other loans that are available so there's a lot of information there it's a lot to digest and uh, i would just just look at the uh, paycheck protection plan if that's a, at all interest to your uh, clients yeah, good comments. And I, to Nicole's point, I've seen some of the uh, language about the 500 or fewer cap. May It might change from industry to industry. There's also dollar thresholds uh, in terms of revenue or net sales. Um, so there are some different moving pieces there that, that could qualify and otherwise uh, face value disqualification. And that PPP, the Paycheck Protection Plan, uh, does look like it's a it's a really useful program for just about any small business that is in an in an ongoing operation right now. Uh, the way it's set up, uh, from my understanding, is uh, you'll look at 2019 uh, pay periods uh, for that entire year, take a monthly average, and then submit a, a loan request for 2.5 times that one month average. That will be handed to you in the form of a loan from SBA, but if it's used to keep employees working, then you're eligible for automatic loan forgiveness at the end of that period. So it, it does look like a, an incredibly useful tool for most businesses. And I would recommend uh, if you haven't looked at that yet, take a look. Um, I know accountants and banks are uh, spending a ton of time trying to get people enrolled in that. Um, going on, the other side of operations is, uh, of course, disruption. And so uh, the three of you, our panelists here, have you seen force majeure provisions that have been sent to you by suppliers or have you had supply chain concerns or issues? Have you had any issues that, where you're initiating force majeure clauses? Um, and what is your advice for companies facing those types of issues? Uh, Dan, let's start with you. So I haven't, I haven't, I've not been made aware of any force majeure being, um, you know, on us. I mean, I think it's just a matter of a lot of the suppliers are saying, look, things are tight. Um, uh, you know, on previous in-house calls, we've heard that, you know, things aren't going to the routine ports. And so based on hot spots, and so it might take more, a while longer and things like that. Uh, so we're obviously uh, worried about PPE, uh, protective, personal protective equipment disruption, as well as, um, drug supply, um, and that can be a whole host of reasons, whether it's 
certain countries playing politics, uh, transportation issues, or just the general supply. So that's what we're looking at. Have we used force majeure? No, uh, it's just more, you know, we try and look at, you know, any sort of contractual relationship we have. We just uh, try and see if there is there a solution around, um, you know, a delay in rendering the service or, or whatever the case might be. So we're looking at it more from that perspective uh, as opposed to pulling the trigger on a force majeure clause. Nicole, how about you? Yeah, we have we haven't had any vendor give us a force majeure yet, but we have seen some non-consumer impacting delays. So we especially in February and early March, we saw delays of equipment that is manufactured in uh, China and Taiwan being delayed. Uh, but these supply chains are for the most part becoming are coming up and running again, although we are taking shipments sometimes by uh, air to different ports and by uh, boat to different ports and having to alter our supply chain mechanisms just depending on who's accepting shipments. Uh, but we haven't seen a vendor use force majeure yet. We don't have any force majeure provisions, just the nature of our work is a little different. Uh, fiber is already in the ground. Uh, but that is, it is a concern in the future though, is uh, this year is what it looks like for fiber access and you know, if we want to get new computers for people at work, those uh, those are kind of uh, kind of scarce to come by right now. If you need new computers, uh, but some of that. So I, I will tell you from my own personal when I'm reviewing contracts, I am making sure I spend a lot more time on those force majeure provisions to make sure I'm comfortable with it, just in case something like this were to ever happen again, uh, that I know kind of what those provisions look like. Thanks, Nicole. Mike, anything else to add on, on your side of uh, industry? Um, we we haven't received any force majeure um, notifications as of yet. There are a couple that we are um, monitoring fairly closely, in particular with the um, decrease in um, energy consumption related to the ethanol market uh, and need for ethanol for that matter. Um, there's a number of, of corn supply contracts that we're following closely. It, when it comes to, I've, I've been with the organization for about five or six years now, and um, I've seen it happen once before um, where a railroad has actually provided us with force majeure because the railroad was actually flooded and underwater. Um, it, it's one of those things where I don't know from a practical standpoint um, as attorneys if, if, if we can actually litigate it fast enough to resolve or mitigate the business risks. So most often from what I've seen from my perspective is our um, for example, our, our grain department um, is having to come up with backup plans and contingency, contingency plans uh, to mitigate any potential business damages that there could be. Uh, we've never tried to collect on those uh, if, they, if there were any losses, um, but to the best of our ability, that's really what we are preparing to do in case something like that happens and find an alternative market for our, for our product, at least in the short term. Yeah, it's a tough situation and it's it's not an easy issue. Um, Dakota Layers faced that in 2015 when we were in the news for uh, being on the losing end of bird flu. Um, we had to initiate those types of clauses uh, at a point where we literally had zero birds to produce eggs on our contracts. Um, I have seen uh, at least one to date about um, a purchaser um, where they just had uh, an entire supply chain dry up or a, a customer chain dry up due to mandated closures. And so it, it is an ongoing issue. I think it's something that we all need to be aware of and looking for. If you haven't reviewed contracts to see what those provisions are, I recommend you go back and do that now. Um, but as our panelists have all I think discussed. I, I think this is a matter of working with your customers and your producers and suppliers wherever you fall in that chain to to mitigate as much of the uncertainty as possible, uh, even in real time. Going back to employee issues, um, obviously with the kind of chaos that this situation is causing, people working from home out of their uh, comfort zones. How have you as as companies, if you have, uh, what what steps have you taken to address mental health concerns of your employees uh, or of yourselves or your peers? Um, Nicole, do you want to start? 
Sure. So we do have an employee wellness plan that we're working on. It's for all employees, but specifically, you know, working on the work from home folks. Uh, we ask employees some some questions and we have instruct their supervisors to talk to them about how they're doing using kind of a rating system, all voluntary, uh, just to make sure that we're, you know, open access and that we're getting a pulse for our employees. Uh, we freed up some different health resources underneath our insurance programs and make sure that we're communicating those out as often as we can. Um, our book clubs are continuing to meet, so we use uh, we use an internal WebEx system. We form some new teams in there to try to get people just to feel like they're connected, especially folks who live at home or who have had any issues of anxiety or depression in the past. Uh, some departments are still having contests, like wear your best tropical shirt at home. Uh, we've done things like referring to your children as coworkers when they're running around being naughty on. Uh, conference calls. So you can say, you know, my coworker is getting himself a snack of ketchup straight out of the bottle, uh, which eases some of the tension there. And we've really encouraged those types of stories throughout the company. Uh, just because it is stressful, obviously, working at home, especially if you've got kids at home, we have a three-year-old and a four-year-old, it can be, uh, it can be trying. So we've been doing some of those programs. We do have an employee program. It's gonna probably ramp up here as we anticipate being at home at least all of April and maybe May as well. So working on some of that. That all sounds really good. And it's really proactive too. Uh, Mike, have you guys been doing anything? Yeah, this has been something that our HR department and our communications department has been um, kind of working on robustly. Uh, it comes back to kind of a lot of what Nicole was talking about, but ramping up a lot of communications, um, reaching out. Uh, we use Zoom technology for our meetings, and so uh, encouraging people to uh, turn the video on and see people face to face. Um, we've been asking our management teams to step up and lead on these issues. Something just as simple as asking people how their day is going, taking some extra time to check in with people um, and, a, and have that conversation that you might have if you're if you were in the hallway rather than just being on the phone uh, and so doing what we can in those areas as well because it is a, a different set of environments for a lot of folks to uh, to work with and I know even the team that I work with um, I feel like I have to every morning now I'm checking in via text or or via email right away when I wake up and making sure that they're um, checking in on how they're doing and seeing what they're doing it's just a matter of doing the same things we do every day but changing the mode and method in which we communicate yeah, good comments. And Beth and I, right before we started this webinar, uh, Beth made a comment about this situation uh, humanizing people and in our interactions uh, professionally and and you know in our personal relationships. And so I think even your example about being in the hallway and keeping your phone in your pocket or whatever it might be, uh, I think is a, a good habit to get into and in, in practice. Uh, Dan, anything that you want to add? Yeah, this is Dan. Uh, we're utilizing our EAP um, employee assistance program uh, for our employees as well, encouraging them, but also just kind of what you were saying earlier about, you know, tips and managing employees remotely. And uh, you already talked about it, but, you know, routine contacts and, you know, try and keep the, the virtual meetings going as best you can. Uh, and then, uh, you know, set clear expectations, even though you're at home, these are the expectations and Obviously, for us, reminding employees about their responsibility with protected health information, even while they're working from home, uh, you know, try and situate your computer away from family the best you can and uh, make sure you're logging out or locking your screen when you leave the computer, just things like that uh, to keep that information as secure as possible. Great. And I, you know, Nicole made a couple comments earlier, but as we're going through all this uh, planning and trying to be proactive and, and uh, doing things that we think are the best in that moment and, and making good decisions for our employees health and everything else how much of your time are you spending uh, trying to make policies that avoid litigation say six 12 months from now uh, how much of your time is simply just trying to focus on what's most appropriate right now uh, Nicole, your comments that specifically come to mind were about, you know, taking people's temperatures and, um, you know, whether or not people are, you know, officially, you know, able to do that. Uh, how much of your 
uh, planning and policy making has been dedicated to risk avoidance uh, for what might come. Well, a fair amount has been for us. So we have this core prevention team, but then we have meetings every day for our executives uh, to discuss, you know, what's happened, how do we have to react, you know, what are the attorneys saying? And sometimes that's the in-house. We're just a small in-house group of three attorneys, and sometimes it goes to our outside uh, counsel for analysis. But I mean, it's it's a daily check in every day on what the risk issue what the risks are and trying to wade through the waters uh, it's the toughest i think in the employment realm on ada and adea and the different directives that come from the states it's really trying to make sure that we're doing what's right for our employees and our consumers but also trying to protect from litigation and so there's probably been more documenting on contracts than i would normally do but I'd say a good portion of my day now is focused on, at least indirectly, the COVID-19. Sure. Mike, Dan, any additions to that? It's pretty similar from where we're at for us. We're going into our busy season with planting, and so uh, I think we're all, uh, many of us are in the same boat and be feeling a little bit overwhelmed, uh, and uh, like we're back in law school, maybe during finals week at some point in time. but. Uh, that's uh, that's at least where I think um, we've been and definitely dedicating quite a bit of time as well. Sure. This is Dan. Yeah, very similar. Um, a lot of labor issues, and then obviously we're getting into treatment protocols and things like that. If uh, the true surge uh, hits, um, the good news is that hasn't, um, you know, I call it the, you know, trying to figure out who's most appropriate for event. That really hasn't happened anywhere as far as I know in the US, except for maybe New York. Um, so even in the other hot spots that we had, no one's gotten to that yet, uh, but obviously planning for that just in case it does happen. Um, and then, you know, just trying to assure people that although there's no guarantees in life that, you know, we're just, uh, that these are the standards of care that are being developed across the country. And and so, um, you know, one of the, one of our, healthcare colleagues in Texas said, well, we're damned if we do, damned if we don't. So just do it the best you can and you're going to get sued anyway. So uh, we'll deal with it at that time and and uh, and go from there. But obviously our uh, malpractice carriers and everything, you know, stand behind us in, in these types of decisions. So that's good. Uh, uh, by that, I mean, you're, you're damned if you uh, take someone off the ventilator and then you're damned if you don't put someone on the ventilator because someone else wasn't as uh, worthy of the vent. So, um, but I think we've got a good, uh, good solution. And I think that solution is being adopted, you know, both uh, locally uh, and statewide as well as what those protocols are going to be. So, um, and like I said, I, I hope that we don't even have to worry about those protocols uh, because uh, hopefully we won't have to use them, uh, but we're ready uh, if they are. So that's been a lot of the legal issues and, and risk issues that we're we're taking on in that way. Um, obviously, in healthcare, we are, we're a little different with regard to um, uh, what we can do for our employees on screening. Uh, I, you know, obviously, we're regulated uh, on what we have to screen for normally before COVID, and then with COVID, obviously, we have a an obligation and and uh, no issues with the ADA and you know taking temperatures and things like that with our screenings and putting badges, buttons on our badges that we were screened this day and, and those sorts of things. So um, that's about it. Uh, but a lot of issues regarding standard of care have been uh, vetted out quite a bit as well as labor issues that Nicole touched on. Great, thanks. I know that's really tough stuff that you guys are looking at there. Uh, we're getting down to time here. I, I want to ask you each uh, to just share any other final thoughts. And then I think Beth said if we run over just a little bit to take some questions, if there are any, that would be all right. So, Mike, why don't you start? Is there anything else that you want to touch on um, related to this issue that, that you'd like to share? Um, I guess just two things. And first one um, is just as, as we look to this, and one of the things we have to do as attorneys is just continue to think about what's ahead. Um, and so, you know, when we draft our policies to the, to the best we know of as of today, or um, when we hand, you know, employees letters designating them as critical, um, you know, trying to be able to not have to do that every single time a new shelter in place um, order gets, you know, gets put into place. 
um, and certainly things like that. So I would just, you know, those are the things that, um, you know, we try to think about in terms of trying to interrupt business as, as little as possible as we, as we all work through this scenario. Um, and then I would just reiterate what we talked about earlier. Um, you know, I think sometimes we as attorneys get so busy that we just focus on our daily duties of what we need to get done. Um, and uh, I think we're all here as resources, at least I know you can reach out to, to me if you have questions or um, if you have questions on policies or ideas of what other folks are doing, I'm happy to share those with folks uh, on this call and others as well. Thanks, Mike. Good thoughts. Uh, Dan, uh, anything you wanted to add? Uh, just that it's, uh, you know, uh, one of those things where these situations where you just are very much appreciative of flexibility. I mean, you just have to be flexible in, in how you respond to these things. Uh, a lot of this is, is uncharted territory since 28 or since 1918. And so, um, you know, to this level, that is. Um, so you just got to be flexible and, and do the best you can with it. And, you know, at some point, document reasons why, why you're doing it and hope that carries the day in the long run. But it's being flexible. Thanks, yeah. Nicole. And I, I'd echo that. Uh, I think it, I think it was Mike's comment that we're this we're living in a time of perpetual law school exams feels very accurate. Uh, the only thing I'd put on a, on a uh, tangible level is we are seeing a real increase in cybersecurity threats and phishing attempts, and we are seeing a lot of our con customers who are starting to kind of call in. Well, hey, my internet's not working. This isn't working, and there have been issues with cybersecurity uh, on some of, especially on some of the conferencing websites. So just be careful that you are mining cybersecurity issues and maybe increasing some uh, proactive attempts to reduce phishing, especially. Yeah, that's a really good comment and kind of scary, unfortunately, especially in this uh, kind of hyper vulnerable state that we're all in. Um, I, I think that's a pretty good spot to wrap up for now um, in terms of what we're preparing. So I want to quickly thank all the panelists for taking their time to share thoughts and experiences. Um, special thanks to Nicole, uh, who serves as our chair of our in-house committee, and she's given the in-house council a platform to discuss and work through some of the most challenging issues we're seeing uh, as a, in a productive or collaborative way uh, and a lot of times in real time. Um, and then also thanks to Beth and the bar for being, um, you know, giving us a kind of an amplification of our collective insight to the rest of our peers. And so I think Beth, I'll just turn it over to you if you have any feedback or if there's any questions you want the panelists to review. There is only one question in the queue and that is, um, what or who actually issues the essential work or, letters that are, are given out to employees that have to be on site? This is, so this, go, oh, ahead. go ahead. Well, this is Dan, and I was just going to say that um, Avera has taken the position that we don't need to issue letters based on the executive orders. Um, you know, people aren't getting stopped and questioned why they're out and about. Um, and so what we have said is that when you're going to and from work, just make sure you have your ID badge handy and then should, you know, if you get picked up for something else like speeding or a moving violation uh, and they ask you what you're doing out and about, just make sure you have your badge with you. So, and I think that, I think there's an FAQ out there in Minnesota that said letters aren't required. Yeah, and it's the um, U.S. Department of Homeland Security. It's their like cybersecurity, it's CISA, C-I-S-A. Uh, that's got the guidance on what is considered an essential worker. We did issue our employees uh, letters because we had problems with private daycares not taking our employees' children. Uh, so we did issue letters, but we are also in Kansas, which has a, a little bit more strict, and in Minnesota where we ran into some issues with daycare. So we issued the letters, and to the letter, it comes from our chief legal officer. Attached to it is the CISA guidance from the Department of Homeland Security and then to carry your badge. Yeah, so I think the summary to answer that question is the, the employer is the one that's providing the letter. Uh, the employers are doing that based on guidance from federal uh, sources. Um, and then even with the code of layers where we're sending 
uh, freight and shipments from South Dakota to California or Pennsylvania or Texas, wherever, we make sure that our truck drivers uh, all have a letter um, just because each state is kind of approaching this a little differently. We want to at least have some consistency. And so we think that gives our drivers at least that uh, assurance that they've got some support there. Beth, was, was there anything else or how do you want to wrap up if there are no other questions? Yeah. So there are no further questions. And so I, I just want to thank you, Jason, for moderating the panel and thank you to our presenters today. Uh, for the attendees, if you have any other questions, feel free to send them directly to me and I will get them back to the, the panelists in which they were directed to. And once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation. And we'd appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within the next 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. And that will also be posted to our State Bar's CLE materials page. So on behalf of the State Bar of South Dakota and our presenters today, thanks to all of those that were able to attend and we hope you stay safe and enjoy the rest of your week. Thanks Beth. Thanks Beth.